Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition Diva Podcast. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel. Thanks so much for tuning in. The FDA recently announced that it's planning to increase its oversight of the multi-billion dollar supplement industry. Now, that would include everything from the calcium and multivitamins at your local drugstore to those questionable weight loss and virility supplements that you see pitched on late night cable TV stations. According to the FDA, three out of every four Americans takes a dietary supplement on a regular basis. And for older Americans, that rate rises to four out of five. Meanwhile, one in three of our kids are taking supplements. Now, all of these are currently regulated under guidelines known as DSHEA, that stands for Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. According to these regulations, Manufacturers are responsible for ensuring that their products are safe and correctly labeled. However, unlike drug makers, supplement manufacturers do not have to submit proof of safety or efficacy before bringing their product to market. It's sort of an honor system. If you get caught doing something wrong, you'll be punished. But for the most part, and without evidence to the contrary, there's an assumption that people are following the rules. In the 25 years since these regulations were enacted, the supplement industry has grown tenfold from about 4,000 products back in 1994 to over 50,000 different products now. With this explosive growth has come an increasing number of what FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb calls bad actors, companies that are either intentionally or maybe even accidentally breaking the rules. As a result, there's a greater chance that consumers will be exposed to products that have undeclared or even illegal ingredients or contaminants. And there's also a greater chance that products may include unapproved or inaccurate health claims. In response to all of this, Gottlieb intends to step up enforcement of the regulations, and hopefully this will result in fewer people going to the hospital emergency room due to adverse effects from dietary supplements. In 2015, for example, there were 23,000 such visits. But to tell you the truth, even when manufacturers are strictly obeying the rules, there's still a lot of potential for consumers to be wasting their money on supplements that simply aren't doing anything for them. So let's talk about how dietary supplements are marketed. With the exception of a small number of approved claims, manufacturers are not allowed to say that a dietary supplement will cure, treat, or prevent a specific disease or symptom. They're limited to what we call structure function claims. For example, they're not allowed to say that a calcium supplement will prevent osteoporosis. They can only say that calcium supports bone health. Manufacturers and their marketing teams have long since learned how to communicate in code. Supplements don't reduce arthritis pain, they maintain joint flexibility. They don't reduce cholesterol, they help maintain healthy cholesterol levels. They don't fight viral infections, they support a healthy immune function, and so on. But look, no one is really fooled by this. Just as supplement manufacturers have learned to talk around the regulations, we consumers have learned to read between the lines. If it's called osteopalooza and there's a picture of an older woman on the front and it says something about maintaining healthy bones, we're going to connect the dots. We're unlikely to be dissuaded or disturbed by the fact that the bottle also says in small print, these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to treat, prevent, or cure any disease. I mean, has that ever stopped you from buying a supplement? I'm really glad that the FDA will be increasing its oversight of the supplement industry, and hopefully it will keep some people from getting hurt. Unfortunately, stepped-up oversight probably isn't going to make much of a dent in the tens of billions of dollars that we waste on supplements that are completely legal and yet largely ineffective. That responsibility falls on us consumers. Just because a given nutrient supports bone health or immune function or brain health doesn't mean that taking it will reduce your risk of developing osteoporosis or cancer or dementia. And in fact, a growing number of studies demonstrate that most of the supplements we take do not have any demonstrable benefits in terms of our long-term health or disease risk. 
if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'll know that for the most part, I'm not a big fan of most supplements. Not only are the benefits questionable, but in some cases, they may actually do harm. Fish oil and calcium, which are two of the most popular supplements, are good examples here. Calcium is important for building strong bones, and it's true that osteoporosis is a leading cause of disability among older women. However, taking high doses of calcium after menopause does not reduce the risk of osteoporosis, and it may increase the risk of heart attack. Omega-3 fatty acids are important for heart health, and heart disease is the leading cause of death. And yet, it's become increasingly clear that while eating fish is linked with lower rates of heart disease and other diseases, taking fish oil supplements is not. Now, of course, there are some situations when targeted supplementation makes sense. For example, to correct a documented deficiency. If your doctor has diagnosed you with an iron deficiency, for example, you'd probably be given an iron supplement and it would be a good idea to take it. Supplements can also be used to address a specific symptom or concern. So if you're taking a course of antibiotics, taking a probiotic might help prevent antibiotic-related diarrhea. Or if you have arthritis pain in your knees, you might want to try a glucosamine supplement to see if it helps, but if it doesn't help, there's no point in continuing. A third reason that supplementation might make sense is to compensate for a specific nutrient shortfall. For example, if you're just unable to get the recommended amount of calcium from your diet, you might want to take a calcium supplement but only as much as you need to fill that gap between what your diet is already providing and the recommended intake. But the indiscriminate use of random supplements to improve your health or prevent disease is just about always a waste of money. Taking a B vitamin complex, for example, will not give you more energy. And unfortunately, antioxidant supplements do not reduce the risk of cancer. Isolated nutrients just don't provide the same benefits as eating the foods that are rich in those vitamins. Taking a supplement made from powdered superfoods, for example, does not provide the same benefit as eating fruits and vegetables. And if you're already eating those fruits and vegetables, well, then you're not getting any extra benefit from taking that supplement in addition. Even worse, I've found that taking nutritional supplements often creates a false sense of security, that you've got your bases covered and therefore you can just eat whatever you want. Now, in that case, not only are you not getting the benefits of eating whole nutrient-dense foods, but then you're also exposed to the negative effects of ultra-processed or other junk foods that you might be eating. Look, we spend $50 billion a year on supplements that are providing little to no benefit I think we could get a lot more benefit from spending that money on nutritious food. Heck, for what some people are spending on supplements, they could afford nutritious food plus a chef to cook it for them. If you take random dietary supplements in the vague hope that they're making you healthier, you might want to consider how you might spend that money on your health more effectively. Maybe you could subscribe to a meal kit service or a produce box that would help you eat more vegetables. Perhaps you could save enough to join a gym or a yoga studio, or maybe you'd have enough to pay for a cleaning service so that you'd have time to use that gym membership you're already paying for. Have you got some other ideas? I'd love to hear them. You can leave me a voicemail on the Nutrition Diva listener line. That's at 443-961-6206. Or of course, you can always find me on the Nutrition Diva Facebook page. And if you'd like some help, figuring out how to make your diet healthier without making yourself crazy, why not join us for the next Nutrition Upgrade program? It's a fun 30-day group challenge that we do just twice a year, but the benefits last far longer than 30 days. All the details are at nutritionovereasy.com slash upgrade. I hope you'll check that out. You'll find a transcript of today's episode along with the complete Nutrition Diva archives at nutritiondiva.quickanddirtytips.com. Thanks for listening and have a great week.